You know, with, with the worship service, I think one of the things that I forget and that we all forget from time to time is that the purpose of it is embodiment. The whole reason that we gather together to study scripture and to talk about God in the same physical space is because our physical bodies are such a huge part of who we are and what this is. So the act of worshiping, whether or not you're singing along or anything like that, the act of, of posturing your body and opening yourself up to spiritual realities as a physical being is why we do that. Um, and, and there's a distinction, I think, between embodiment and performance. And that's kind of what I was just saying about, you know, there's some Sundays where you can get up here and your, your mind is f uh, focused on what you're presenting, what people are receiving from you. Like right now, I'm having a hard time fighting that. Like I'm worried about how clearly I'm speaking, whether or not I seem nervous, that kind of stuff. But in reality, I should be embodying this moment. Just be here. Don't worry about that stuff. Just communicate clearly. Be in my body. And I think that's really difficult for a lot of us because especially in this version of Christianity that's come up in the West over the last couple of centuries, we've made a very strong distinction between the mind and the body. We really prefer the mind. We like to use the mind to distance ourselves from things that are uncomfortable, like pain, suffering, all this other stuff. And the body is a huge source of a lot of that, right? The older you get, the more things start to fail. Um, I look back at my own life, and, and I grew up with... Uh, you know, one parent who just didn't talk about this stuff, and the other one who was constantly lamenting um, her body, you know, just talking about it as though it was a burden, and it was in the way, and it was failing constantly, and just never what she wanted to be. And I think that worked its way into my own thinking, and I thought, well, if this whole thing's temporary, if this body's just going to pass, and my soul's the thing that matters, I'm just not even going to think about it. I'm not going to take any time to take care of it. I'm not going to consider any of the signals that I'm receiving from it. I'm just I'm just going to disregard that, focus on my mind and my spirit, and everything's going to be fine. Um, but it's not true. Um, when you take a step back and look at the relationship that we have as a being, it's between our body, our mind, and our spirit. And that's a Trinitarian relationship, much like God, you know. It's one of the concepts that we wrestle with the most in our tradition. How can God be one being? but distinctly Father, Son, and Spirit. But He is. And we are the three different elements. We can, we can think about it and kind of separate those elements and think about them differently and treat them differently, but they are all pieces of our, of our singular being, of our human being. So the question I really wanted to ask is, are we fully alive? How, how alive are we actually, especially if we're disregarding such a huge part of who we are and how we're here. Um, in the books that, that I was reading for class, one author was talking about her experience of having a car wreck when she was younger. And like we all do with significant trauma in our lives, it's hard to process it. It's hard to understand how God could let something so violent or painful happen. And so a lot of us compartmentalize that stuff. We stuff it down, we push it to the side, we choose not to look at it. And we convince ourselves that that means it's not real, it's gone, it didn't happen. I'll let myself forget. And while the mind might forget over time, the body doesn't, the spirit doesn't. That's something that happened in reality. And that trauma stores itself somewhere. For this author, it was, um, she, had, she was getting a massage uh, later in her life, and when the masseuse got to a specific spot in her shoulder, she flashed back to the car accident and like yelped and was, was physically in the same position that she was in during the accident, not realizing that by not processing that trauma, by not walking through the pain of it, she had kind of pushed it into a singular spot, and it was a spot of physical pain and tension in her life. I look at my own life and I can see the same thing, where I've never, I've been fortunate to never experience something so violent, so physical as that, but Emotionally and mentally, I've been a very sensitive and a very vulnerable person all my life. And I think back to high school, and you know, I couldn't walk through the lunchroom without being a turtle. I would hide myself as best I could, or like try to defend myself from people looking at me. I wasn't even conscious of it. Somebody called me out on it in college, and I was like, "Oh, I'm just trying to fix that." Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't, you know, in the middle of a crowded room like the lunchroom I was in, in the classroom, and I would pick the seat in the corner, and I would turtle like this, and I would just make nobody look at me. Don't. Now as an adult, I have chronic shoulder pain. 
Hmm. It's that simple. I was <laughs> holding my body in a position that it didn't want to be in. And so you look at that and say, okay, well, you, that was pretty dumb. Why did you do that? And it's like, well, emotionally and mentally, I was wrestling with stuff and it manifested. It came through in my body. If I had been listening to my body signals then, I might have been able to reverse engineer and figure out, oh, I'm anxious and I don't have to be, you know. If, if I listen to the way my body wants to be held, I take up more space, I'm more of a person, I'm actually here, you know. But it's taken me this long to figure that out. Um, you know, we, I've really enjoyed the last couple of weeks that Bo has been preaching because what he's been digging into and kind of discussing is ways in which we can continually come back to God over and over again throughout the day as often as possible. You know, whether it's multiple times in one day or, or just, you know, once a day, if it's more often than once a week, we are increasing our exposure to God, our relationship with the Spirit. We are honing that relationship. And I think for a lot of us who are disembodied, and, and you may not think you are, and maybe you aren't, but if you, if you think of your body as a burden, if you think of it as something separate, if you refer to your body parts as, as baggage in some way, or if the doctor gives you a diagnosis and you're resentful of what they're telling you to do differently with your body, I think that is an indicator that maybe you're not fully present with your own body. Maybe you are pushing it to the side and letting it you know, live its own life almost. But our body is the first gift we ever received from God. It's the very first thing we were given, and then he gave us the breath to animate it. But the body was first. It's our first point of contact with the Creator. If we disregard it altogether, that could be interpreted as a pretty big slight to the gift giver, right? This is something, you know, it says we were fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a, a huge indicator of design and intention and to not honor that with what time we have feels like a pretty significant mistake or, you know, a sin in the truest sense to miss the mark, to be off of the target. So let's go to the Bible verse. Um, this is 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's something that I, I definitely heard a lot as a, a child. You know, your body is a temple. That's why you shouldn't smoke, shouldn't drink, shouldn't do all these things, because the Holy Spirit lives inside you. And it's true. I was fascinated when I was looking for verses that support this idea of embodiment because that may be one of the only ones, and guess who wrote it? It was Paul, because Paul is the only one that seems to write about flesh or body at all throughout the New Testament. And I was really kind of puzzled by that. Like, why isn't there more discussion of our relationship to our bodies? And it dawned on me, at this time and in this place, it, that would have been the reality. They didn't have screens to fall into as soon as they were done being phys you know, physically laboring. Their physical body was their life. They had to use it every day, all the time, to survive, to engage with the world around them. Even, you know, these days we lose hours and hours and hours to stories, television, uh, podcasts, all kinds of media. But in that time, the only way that a story could have been, you know, really well transmitted was in person, body to body, voice to ears. It was a physical act. So they wouldn't have had to think about how to become embodied. They were embodied beings. That's probably why Paul spent so much time writing about distinguishing between the mind and the, and the body, or the spirit and the body. That may have been a newer line of thinking at the time. For us, we have to evaluate the way that we're living, compare it to our ancestors, compare it to the, the design that God seems to have put in place, and ask ourselves, are we fully alive? Are we fully accountable for what we've been given? If this is a temple of the Holy Spirit, am I treating it that way? And if I was, what would be different? If we took inventory of everything that we have control over, our mind, our body, and our spirit, and we really tried to see that in relationship, not distinguish between them and, and lament one and only cling to the other, but see how they inter, interwork and, and really focus on honing that relationship, how much more could we do for God? How much more could we be right here, right now, and allow the spirit to tell the mind, to tell the body, to do the thing that the spirit needs done, right? <laughs> Embodiment is itself an act of worship. It is choosing to be in this moment that God is holding. 
I think for a lot of us, in my Southern Baptist tradition, the physical world was treated as a mistake almost. <coughs> this is a sinful and terrible place, and it's all doomed to fade, and we're just waiting it out until we can get to heaven. And while there may be some truth to the temporarity of things and, and our destination, by disregarding where we are and what this is right now, we are allowing a lot of evil to continue manifesting and continue controlling this world that we're participating in. When we insulate ourselves, when we block out the things we don't want to look at, they don't go away. In our experience, they might. But in the reality that we're all sharing, that stuff still exists. One of the most difficult things that I think we're called to do as Christians is embrace suffering. That sounds crazy. Nobody wants to do that. But realistically, if our goal is to emulate Christ in every image that we're given of Christ, he embraced his own suffering, and he didn't want to do it. He said that out loud. If this cup could pass for me, I'd love that. But I understand this is the way things have to be. And he went willfully into a very painful, traumatic situation. Didn't shy away from it. Didn't waste time lamenting it or trying to justify it in other ways. Just let it be what it was. If we took that relationship with our own bodies, you know, stopped using our injuries or our, our failures, you know, if a good friend of mine has had tremors his whole life and so he's always, he says that he's always resented his body because he can look at himself and look at someone else and say, this isn't right, and wonder why God would allow that to happen. From the outside, I can look at that same friend and see that him dealing with that, you know, that suffering throughout his life, that difference in, in ability, has created in him a very sensitive spirit towards suffering. He is somebody who is present with suffering in other people, a, a person who is an ambassador for God in those spaces of suffering because he's familiar with it. If we can become familiar with our own suffering, stop hiding from it, embody ourselves, be present throughout it, we can be so much more effective here and now for God. We can stop running. And that was the other thing that occurred to me. I know I'm all over the place. I can't help it. This is the way I think. I'm really trying to stay on course, but everything's connected to everything else. Um, the first thing Adam and Eve did when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of life and death, or good and evil, was they hid from God. The first choice they made that God was surprised at and displeased with was to hide themselves. If we stop hiding from reality, stop shying away from the stuff that makes us uncomfortable and learn how to live with that stuff, we are so much more able to be present and, and active agents of God's will in those spaces. And if we don't do it, no one else will, because we're the ones that are trying to practice holding the relationship with God. I would encourage all of us to consider our relationship to our bodies. Do you think of it as a separate thing? Do you think of it as a burden? Or do you identify with it too much? Is, is your physical, um, you know, physical pleasure, physical uh, security such a strong factor that you can't willfully enter into painful situations, right? What is your relationship to your body? And what is the relationship between your body and the spirit? Which one are you putting more emphasis on? And, and how can you start to see those things working together to be one whole being that is all of these things at once? The goal is to be fully alive, is to be here now all the time, to be in this moment that God is sustaining. Every chance we get, listening to the Father, listening to the Spirit, but allowing it to speak to us and guide us in this moment as though it's brand new. And I love uh, the verse about coming to, to God as children because over our lives, all of our trauma and all of our experience stacks up and we start to have these rote responses to certain, certain things. Well, I'm not dealing with that, or when that happens, I act this way. How much more good could we accomplish if we approached every situation as brand new? Yes, carry the wisdom of previous experiences, but don't let it be such a determining factor in how you do everything. Treat it as though God is here with you and anything is possible, and see how much more God uses you to make anything else happen. I, uh, I don't know if I had much else to say. Uh, I, I really struggled to figure out what I'm trying to say. What's, what's the gist of it? You know, there's so much. We're talking about suffering. We're talking about trauma. We're talking about embodiment and, and all these other things. 
But that's the goal, is to be fully alive, to be in lockstep with God as often as we can be. And if we're disregarding such a vital part of ourselves, how can we ever do that? How can we accomplish that if we are forsaking the first point of contact, the first gift that God ever gave us? Um, so I also encourage you going forward, you know, the next worship service we have, singing may not be your thing, you may not know the lyrics to the songs, but take that moment to practice embodiment, practice being in your body, listening to the subtle cues that it's giving you. Last time I spoke, I talked about, you know, Paul spins an entire paragraph talking about how dangerous it is to, dangerous it is to let the mind listen to the flesh too much and how the mind should be on things of the spirit. And then the flesh falls in an appropriate relationship. It's in, it's in the right part of the circle to come back around and allow God to use that whole structure. But that's the funny thing is it's, it's at the very end of all of this lamentation about how evil the flesh can be that he's like, but if you put your mind on things of the spirit, God animates the body and you're alive. And that's the goal is to be alive. Not listening to the flesh doesn't mean ignoring hunger or things like that, though. You know, it's it's avoiding the stronger impulses that that serve themselves. We need sleep, we need food, we need to reproduce. But when you listen to those impulses disproportionately, when you pursue pursue the pleasure that comes from those things outside of their context, that's where it creates the feedback loop. That's where you stay dead. You're no longer allowing new information from the source or new direction. You're staying locked into this cycle of, well, my body wants this, and it's keeping my mind alive so that I can keep serving it. If you can see through that, through the strong signals, through those, those really powerful urges, you can start to hear your body telling you much more subtle things, like you really do kind of carry your shoulders up around your ears, or you slump when you speak because you don't want people to think that you think too highly of yourself. You don't have to do that. You're a child of God. It's okay. You can be here. You're allowed. I put you here. God's telling us all that without words, without our mind needing to be able to, to process that language. It's all subtle, it's all physical and present. And if we practice listening to that, we become more fully alive. We become more fully present with God in this place and in this moment. So not just in worship, not just once a week on Sunday, every chance you get, take a moment to check in with your body, ask it, how, you, how it feels about, you know, the emotional things that you've been coming through, the spiritual things you've been considering. Process your body's relationship to those things and, and begin to hold all of that together. I'm going to pray for us and let us go. I really don't know what else to say. Uh, I'm hoping, you know, I'm going to be speaking next Sunday and I'm hoping I'll have a bit more structure and things like that. But, uh, I got overwhelmed every time I tried to think about what I wanted to say today because it's all it all feels so important to me and it all feels just difficult to get into. You know, it's hard to understand where everybody is on this topic. It's hard to say something that's valuable to everybody other than we should be trying to be fully alive. So I'll pray for us and let us go. Father, thank you for this time and this space. Thank you for sustaining this moment and allowing us to be a part of it, for placing us here and for giving us hearts that are seeking direction from you, seeking to be closer to you and in, in, in close relationship to you. I pray, Father, that you would help us to keep our hearts open to that relationship at all times, that you would keep us from becoming calloused and isolated from the creation that you placed us in. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to identify the areas in our life that you're asking us to be more open and more willing to, to do your will, that we could step into those spaces with a full heart, knowing that you're there with us, knowing that we may not see or hear you in the ways that we expect, but that you are the only being that is allowing this to happen in the first place. You are everything. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hold that in our hearts constantly, that we would be continuously aware of the miracle that is this moment, the miracle that is existence in this vast void of space. I pray, Lord, that you would just use these willing hearts to fulfill what you need fulfilled. Turn us into kingdom servants. 
Turn us into workers of the field that you placed before us and help us not to find excuses and reasons to step away from that work. Help us to use the bodies that you've given us and, and, and to be grateful for this entire messy package that is life. In Jesus' name.